you're a young person uh, who's grown up during 20, 30 years of reform, all you've seen is increasing uh, improvement in quality of life. You've seen increasing improvement around personal freedoms. Nobody uh, dictates as strongly as in the past where you would work. Um, you know, even restrictions around where you live are much looser than before. You can certainly read much more widely than ever before. So I'm not denying that there hasn't been, you know, tremendous progress. Um, and some of that does uh, incorporate democratization with a small d. On the question of the village elections, I remember some years ago, one of the f officials who was intimately involved from the Ministry of Civil Affairs in promoting the village election in a press conference uh, with foreigners made the following comment. He said, well, at one level, you're telling us these elections are meaningless, and now you're telling us people are buying votes. Well, if the election's meaningless, why are they paying, paying money to buy people's votes? It doesn't make sense. So obviously, something is involved in the power you get from winning the elections. I thought it was an interesting observation. It's true that in villages where single clans dominate, um, they're always going to win, but that's not unusual. I mean, if, uh, if a village is dominated by, you know, 60, 70 percent from one grouping in an electoral system, they're always going to win. But the interesting thing is in the villages that I've looked at, even when there was no village election, the village head and the party secretary always came from that clan anyway. So I'm not sure that makes a you know, tremendous difference. From what I've seen of research, where uh, village elections are strongly contested, and they're the norm now, let's not forget that. You know, village elections are in the law. They happen regularly every three years in a rotating cycle between different villages. What I've seen from the research is that in the very rich villages and the very poor villages, there appears to be very little contestation. Similarly, where one clan dominates, but that's not the, the case with all villages. In those villages which are in the sort of middle income ranges, uh, there tends to be much more contestation and discussion uh, during the electoral process. So I think it has been on the whole a plus and a positive. Um, in terms of citizen, uh, in terms of um, um, the way officials are assessed, Yes, it does have some positive impact because of the requirement to ensure social stability within your jurisdiction. But it also, I think, leads to often quickly trying to resolve um, protests, either by brutality, by hiring in local thugs to pick off the local leaders or to beat them into submission. And part of the problem, of course, is that the way they go to target ringleaders, often means that, and because they deny association, you don't know who to talk to to try and resolve the dispute. So it really leads to two different outcomes. You don't have a structure through which the government can then engage representatives, uh, in most cases, who are protesting. So either you crush it by brutality or you pay it off, which is increasingly uh, the case in many jurisdictions. You pay the money to go away, so you don't have a blot on your copybook. And of course, what that can lead to is more protests because people know, well, hey, look, they paid those guys to get off the streets over there. Let's protest, because if we sit at home and accept this abuse, we'll get nothing. If we burn a few cars of officials, you know, okay, one or two are going to get arrested, but at least some of us will get compensation for it. But ultimately, sir, the last point I just want to make on that, Dick, is that <clears throat> Ultimately, it comes down again to the questions of governance, because a lot of these protests are sparked by the lack of um, transparency about government actions. A lot of it is because they just don't know what kind of compensation is being paid if it's confiscation of land. And so, yes, they could maybe make a complaint, and maybe the complaint would be listened to, but perhaps a better way to have dealt with it would have been to um, negotiate with um, the farmers in the first place. It was interesting, in a survey I did some years ago, it was noticeable, uh, it was, unfortunately it was a very small sample because a lot of the villages that we were surveying in hadn't had protests over land confiscations. But in those few that had, 
uh, the respondents said that the conflict was much less where there had been consultation in advance. In those villages where there had been conflict, they basically said they were in the dark and there was no consultation before. The village councils, do they have any power or is it just a matter of being able to insist on looking at the books? Well, the answer to that is yes, they do. I mean, you know, villages are autonomous organizations. They don't have um, a formal state structure uh, embedded in them. So they are self-governing agencies. I mean, let's remember the reason why the village elections uh, were brought in was because of the rise in protest within the villages with the abandonment of the collective structures. And there was really no governing mechanism for pulling together disputes within uh, village communities. And uh, one thing that I think particularly <clears throat> concerned the leadership were things that its policies weren't being obeyed, particularly uh, the family planning uh, regulations, even though they were not as stringent as they later became in the 1990s. And so they felt there was a lack of governability within the villages. Then, very importantly, Pang Jun was the head of the um, National People's Congress at the time. And he'd run a village election program when he was in one of the base areas before 1949. And so you got this uh, strange coming together of a problem in the villages with a guy running the MPC who'd run village elections before and understood you could have village elections without threatening Communist Party power. And so the village elections initially were thought of as a way of providing a vehicle and a mechanism for brokering disputes and basically making decisions on how to allocate resources in villages. Now, that means that they do have considerable power and there's a lot of regulations now about what they have to post in terms of um, uh, revenues and expenditures within the village. They often have to put up on uh, public display certain things like um, how much are local, the village officials paying for electricity. So when I've been in villages, one of the things that people always look at is, you know, how much is the party secretary paying for electricity? And you see a lot more than other villagers. So, you know, he's probably got a color television, a computer, and washing machine, a refrigerator that many other villagers might not have. So I think it is having an impact, but the really, then there have come two issues. The first is uh, there's a huge difference between, you know, the wealthy villages that have a lot of largesse to dispense and have to make extremely serious decisions about whether to invest that in social welfare funds, infrastructure funds within the village, uh, building, you know, repairing the school and so forth. And there I think from what I've seen is there is a lot of debate uh, within those communities. Um, and then you have the very poor villages that really have no uh, resources that can be dispensed. But they're under tremendous pressure from the higher levels of government to fulfill certain social obligations that the higher levels of government have set. Then you begin to see more rapacious activity by the local government officials, even if they are elected, because they have to find ways to generate funds to pay for certain obligations which are required by the higher level governments. So like, you know, everything in China, it's a hugely mixed picture. I can, you know, quote you examples of villages which I think are run extremely well, are run to the benefit of the registered inhabitants of the villages. I can also quote you examples of extremely venal uh, local leadership in villages that I've seen. Okay, one might be able to do that still in the United States, and boy, <laughs> could one have done yeah. done that uh, uh, 50 years ago. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, now, but let, let me get this straight. You're saying it's standard in villages in China, which what means places where about, uh, what would you say, a third, 40% of the people of China live? Uh, it's standard for there to be an elected council mm -hmm. 
that can uh, decide uh, how much is spent on schools and roads, whether uh, collective land is sold to a real estate developer, how much it's sold for, uh, is there a, is the village party secretary, does he offer his proposals to this council, which then gets to vote on them, yes or no? Well, it's a very complex interplay, and again, it depends on the social structure of the village. So, for example, a village that I wrote about in south of China is dominated by one clan. So the head of the village committee and the head of, you know, the party secretary are always from the same clan. And, you know, one is the deputy to the other, and so on and so forth. So there's a very close symmetry between what the party is deciding and what the village village's committee is deciding. The other thing that plays into this factor, though, is the role of the township and how intrusive the township will be into village affairs, because they still do command the uh, party structure. So again, <clears throat> in a number of cases, they might intrude in telling the village what to do. However, it is certainly the case that in terms of infrastructure, a lot of the authority of the township stops at the border of the village. In now, the, a lot of the education costs have now shifted back up the system to the county. And so the county, you know, assumes the financial responsibility for schooling within the village. So, for example, the village that I was just talking about is a very wealthy village. They built themselves a fantastically elaborate elementary school, brought in very qualified teachers, paid them quite high salaries, and then came the decision by Premier Win Jiabao that schooling for rural children for a compulsory period of time should be free and should be responsibility of government. So he said, well, thank you. Gave the school back to the local government, saved themselves a huge amount of money for what they were paying for the school, and moved on. Now, the key issue you're talking about with land, and this is the major problem, is land in the countryside is owned collectively, but there is no clear de definition of what is the collective, and that's where the problem comes. In some areas, the collective is the administrative village. Some areas, it's the township. Some areas, no one's ever decided what it is. And so when you get to these decisions about how collective land will be used, it becomes much more complicated. What I have seen, again, in uh, administrative villages and their natural village components under them, <clears throat> where they still have uh, the right to decision on collective land, that often has been a communal decision for the benefit of the village. And it's been very important that they've held on to that right of um, ownership over the collective land. Often where the problems have come is where the township or other organizations have defined themselves as the collective and then have taken the land away, often arbitrarily, uh, from village communities. And there you often see conflicts. Sometimes you have the conflict even with an administrative village where, um, you know, the leadership, even though it may have been elected, will just quite simply decide this is what we're going to do and then abrogates the rights of the collective to take it over. One of the things the new leadership is trying to push in the rural areas, this is very much modeled on what has happened in southern China, is to give farmers shares and rights within the collective. So basically, things become shareholding uh, cooperatives or collectives within the countryside. And again, that works very well for affluent parts of China because the payouts from those collectives can be quite significant. Again, I'm not sure quite how it will work if you're a shareholder in a collective where there's nothing to share. The picture I'm getting is this, that in the countryside in China, it's standard for local people to have uh, a considerable, broadly speaking, democratic uh, control over the decisions that matter the most to them, provided that they don't rely on resources from outside. Mm -hmm. 
and that's uh, that's a done deal. That's not being tampered with, but there's no push to extend this kind of democratic no. control to the higher levels. Yeah, I think you know if you go to the, you know I've sat in on some of the village meetings and they're very feisty. I mean, you know, despite the arrogance of the central leadership in which they say their suja tidy, their quality is too low, they can't make judgments, they know extremely well what is in their interests. And they have very good political antenna, you know. I remember years ago, I, when I was a student in China, you had to do um, what was called open door schooling. We had to go and work in the commune. And, uh, you know, you would talk with all the supposed intellectuals in the colleges and the universities, and they would ask, you know, how much does a professor earn in England? And you'd tell them, oh, they'd be, oh, that's unbelievable. You'd, the farmers would ask the same question. You know, how much does you know, this profession earn? The next question was, how much is a catty of meat in America? It was much shrewder. They were already calculating and putting it into a context. So they know full well what is in their interests. And so many of these meetings are feisty. As you say, the, the key question is whether then the township level of government really genuinely trusts them to make their own decisions. And there I think you often see this phenomenal arrogance that we know better than they do. You know, they're parochial. They don't really know what's in their best interest. They don't, obviously they don't know what is in the broader general interests beyond their village. And therefore, we have the right to make that decision on their behalf. And that's where you often see then this intrusion from the higher level governments, which they often feel may be acting in the best interest, but often can run against uh, the particular interests of the village community. In cities, does something similar go, go on when one reads of meetings in a neighborhood with a local cadre, perhaps primarily when a uh, potentially controversial decision, mm -hmm. say, about real estate is, is being made. Is it a real and regular consultation which can have some effect? I, my honest answer is I don't really know because, as I, as I said before, things vary so much from place to place. I think one of the challenges is that traditional uh, administrative jurisdictions don't fit any longer with the way populations operate and where they live. So, you know, the old system was pretty much everything went through the work unit. That, that's really what controlled things and that's where debates took place. But, you know, the work unit doesn't control life in the same way as it does anymore. So the Communist Party has had to think of new mechanisms uh, to try and be inclusive. So through these uh, communities, the shirtu, as they call them. But you've also got this growing phenomenon of people, middle classes, moving in behind their walls. You know, you see it all over China, walled estates, with often very fancy apartments, sometimes villa compounds. And so, so residence committees are um, growing up, in which a lot is debated, but they don't have any formal placement in the Chinese structure. So you have this problem that there's not a good juxtaposition between the way people are living their lives and where uh, they're working and where they're living and the administrative um, jurisdictions as they existed traditionally. So you're seeing a lot of these kind of ad hoc consultation bodies, organizations coming up or hearings around particular projects. And certainly those are expanding. There's no doubt about that. Now, what is unclear is whether they just have the hearing and then they do what they want anyway, the officials, mm -hmm. or whether it really does affect things. But my suspicion is, over time, uh, whatever the situation is at the moment, they will increasingly have to take into account the views of citizens because um, you know they're becoming increasingly adept at dealing with the system. They're increasingly... Uh, exploiting different sources of information about projects. There are, you know, increasing uh, numbers of regulations and laws on the books about what you can and what you cannot do. And I think um, as urbanization grows, as the middle class grows, I think they'll start appealing to more of those regulations to push their own interests.
you're describing a process that could be called, as the CCP does now, consultative democracy. Uh, suppose I were an ordinary citizen in, well, you choose a village, a neighborhood in uh, Be Beijing, a town. Uh, what capacities would I see growing to make an impact on how I'm governed under this, this new direction of the leadership? Mm -hmm. I think what you would see as, a, as an average citizen um, is that, first of all, you would see that there are, there's a lot more transparency in local government. So as far as um, meetings about open budget, um, as far as town hall meetings, um, online comment periods for different laws, um, there's an increased level of transparency and the ability to participate if you so choose. Um, you would also have the ability to participate um, a lot more extensively in civil society, which is growing in China. Um, it used to be that when I did field work, even, even not that long ago, maybe in like 2006, 2007, if you use the term civil society outside of Beijing and larger cities, people didn't know what you were talking about. But now, even when I go to places that are well off the beaten track in, in places like Yunnan, and I say that I study civil society, um, people will tell me all about the organizations that they've started and how they're working with the local government to improve, let's say, education, rural education. Um, and so now there's this, there's this emergence of a really active civil society in China, and lots of people are participating in the causes that they care about that, through that channel as well. So I think as an average citizen, what you would see is you would see an increased ability to participate in policy decisions, at least at the consultative level. Um, and you would also see an increased ability to participate through direct action by volunteering or donating to um, a civil society organization. So I think as an average citizen, this is what you would see. Um, however, you would also see that signals are being sent that if you go too far, so this wouldn't be an average citizen, but if you were, let's say, a rights lawyer, you would still see that the government is very sensitive about pushing too hard or too fast um, in areas that they deem sensitive. Um, and so really, rights-based work in China, I think, is as difficult as it ever was, and um, at least for the people that I speak with, they would say that the Xi Jinping administration has been maybe slightly more restrictive than maybe the end of the Hu Wen administration. So that's a very complex picture, though, because it's difficult to say things are improving or things are becoming more restrictive because both of these things are happening at the same time, just in different areas. But I think that that sends us a really good signal about potential change in the administration and the direction in which they'd like to go which is that they might continue to increase societal impact or societal participation in policies and in government, but only to the extent that it helps the party and not to the extent that it challenges party authority in any way. Oh, suppose I'm uh, in a migrant neighborhood in, in Beijing. You mentioned schooling, uh, other parents and, and I in this neighborhood don't think much of our school, uh, the teachers are okay, but uh, uh, they're just overwhelmed. They don't have enough facilities. The classes are too big. Our kids aren't passing the all-important exams. Uh, if we go to one of these meetings, can we uh, uh, make our case? Maybe yell at, who would it be, a, a, a local party uh, 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 official, uh, and, expect, and expect it to make a difference? I think the answer to that question is that, that, that if you think about the life cycle of, of the policy process, I think that there are two important periods if citizens want to have an impact. The first is in the very beginning. Um, and I think that if you look at citizens who would attend one of these town hall or public comment period meetings and express an opinion about local education or something like that, I don't know if that would have much impact on its own. Where I see a lot of impact is when those citizens who are really passionate about this local policy also join forces with especially international civil society groups or foundations or uh, funding groups like even the World Bank from outside of China. This is where I see that they can have the most impact in this early stage of the policy process where 
if local government officials are getting external funding or they need external buy-in for whatever reason for a policy reform, a lot of these international foundations or international civil society groups are predicating their funding decisions based on the input of civil society. And so they're requiring the organizations like Local Fund, who um, are working in HIV AIDS um, area, or the World Bank working on development projects, they mandate that there has to be civil society participation in the process of designing the policy. So that's a really effective tool to guarantee that civil society and community voices are being heard in the policy process. But I think more importantly, that in the long term, what's happening is that there's this learning process on the part of local cadres that what they've learned is that if you simply design a policy and implement it, people might not participate with the policy, they might choose not to follow the policy, um, and the cost of trying to get everyone to obey a new law is very, very high. So you need some sort of citizen participation to make any policy effective. And what they found is that if they do actually listen to community input and they do actually try their best to incorporate that into the new policies, the likelihood of that policy that being successful increases substantially. So I think for the first stage, I don't know if local cadres would necessarily take citizen input into account, except that they're being forced to by these external mechanisms like funding from the World Bank. But in a long-term process, I do think that citizen input is showing local cadres that their policies can be more successful, which of course then helps their promotion chances. So I think there is a process over the long term, sort of a virtuous cycle of citizen participation leading to successful policies, leading to successful cadres who then want to listen more and incorporate feedback more. What the state is most concerned with is that whatever type of organization of these societal interests take place, how, however it's, it's undertaken, that this type of organization is done so in ways that are delineated by the state. And that is something that is different from the way, from, from the environment that I documented in the work that I did, because it seemed to me that there were more opportunities for middle level people, for these policy entrepreneurs um, and kind of activist cadres to uh, exploit that situation. It seems to me that there's less of uh, uh, an, uh, an open space for that, or, or, or a policy space for them to do that today. I would agree with that. I think that um, I'm not sure what the cause is, but I agree with the outcome. The cause could be that there's a shift on the part of the administration. However, a lot of these changes were taking place before the Xi administration took over. So what I'm thinking, and I'm not positive about this, but what I'm thinking given the temporal aspect is that what we might be seeing is simply the modernization of the state regulatory system in that we're starting to see that the gray space that a lot of civil society groups worked in is disappearing. That's not necessarily a bad thing. What is being replaced with is a legal environment. So for example, the new ruling is that international um, non-governmental organizations, INGOs, will now all have to register with the government. So there are some who are saying, well, this takes away this gray space in which we've operated maybe as a for-profit enterprise or you know, trying to work with the university and not register at all as a social organization. So in some ways, the, the reduction of this gray space and the creation of a legal space means that there's less room to maneuver. But on the other hand, having a status as a legal entity in China also provides a lot of protection that these, that these organizations desire so that they no longer can be charged you know, with tax evasion or things like that. They're, they're covered under a legal code. It, it's the normalization of the system. And creating a legal system, it takes away some past freedoms, but it might also lead to future freedoms. Um, so it's a, very, it's a very complex situation where I think in some ways we can see the normalization and the, the um, strengthening of the Chinese regulatory state as something that takes away past freedom or, or past gray space, really, because it wasn't exactly freedom. Um, but it also creates this legal space, which could be beneficial or, or could not be beneficial, depending on how the laws are written, as far as what freedom civil society groups are given. Can I just jump on that? Uh, sure. just Because I think that's a really, really important point, and I think that it's one that can be easily 
misconstrued or misinterpreted. Um, and it seems to me that, based on what, what you're finding, Jessica, um, it, it seems that when I was doing my research in this area, there was kind of a lone voice uh, in Yunnan, and that was the Nature Conservancy, which was basically seen by, so unlike the other kind of international NGOs that would have their base of operations in Beijing, they would have their, they had their base of operations in the capital of Yunnan province where they did the lion's share of their work. What was really interesting at the time, this is the mid-aughts, so 2005, 2006, is that they were getting an awful lot of grief from these other NGOs for selling out, for working together with horror of horrors, the provincial government of Yunnan. Um, and in fact, their argument was very much like Jessica's, which was, look, we have to work with these folks. Um, they provide us with kind of the political cover or the political interference, um, interference meaning in, 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 you know, in, in basketball terms, uh, of, of essentially moving us forward in what we need to do and providing us with kind of the necessary resources, political and otherwise, that we need, sure we disagree with them on a lot of their goals. But those are things that we have to put aside because to, for us, you know, we, we can wring our hands and do all this, this stuff. We, we, we can, we can uh, uh, provide all these sound bites and, uh, on the news or we can, we can, we can write all these, all, these, uh, uh, all these bulletins that nobody's gonna read or act upon or we can actually do something. Um, and that was the decision that they made. Um, and as it turns out, they were uh, able to do all sorts of things that other NGOs were unable to do at that time. And they were really um, uh, given a tremendous amount of, ultimately a tremendous scope of, of freedom and ultimately indirectly power in terms of things like establishing the model for a national park system for China, for example. Um, so it's, it's really interesting that it, it seems that that was, at least in retrospect, kind of a, uh, a model or, 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 or an experiment, a policy experiment in, in policy innovation. And now it seems that that has now become more of a model in terms of how kind of NGOs more generally are being kind of brought into the, the political conversation. Let me press... Uh this issue of the shrinkage of, uh, of the gray space uh, and talk about a, a different kind of gray space. Uh, the protests, uh, the local protests that seem to have played a major role in change for the better in China over the course of the last several decades uh, since reform. Uh, right, in recent years, probably 100,000 or more small protests uh, a year. The, in the 90s, the farmers raise hell, and after two millennia, the agricultural tax is finally abolished. Uh, the uh, workers in uh, the Rust Belt, in particular, who are suffering from the loss of their factory-based sa safety net uh, uh, as uh, state-owned enterprises are closed down, go on strike illegally, raise, he raise hell, and there's the start of the movement of funds from the coast to the west and uh, uh, that starts to make their lives better in uh, uh, cities in which uh, uh, public land is, uh, is sold and people think is sold at uh, too low a price. Uh, people raise hell against probably the most important form of corruption, and they, they make some, some progress. Now, my sense, and here I'm asking the two of you if, if this is right, is that the new leadership's moves to own the process of change in China are going to involve decreased tolerance for protest, uh, they seem to involve uh, a decreased space for even the verbal protest over the internet that's played an important role. Half a billion people on the internet in China, netizens is their call. They've been very important outside of official organizations, not even NGOs. Doesn't this make 
the restriction of political action not under the party's control a serious loss for the Chinese political process? I, I, that's a really good question because there's a strange dynamic that's occurring in China because I think on the surface that would be the logical explanation that we would use, which is that it, it's very clear that the new administration is not going to allow for social protest. They've already instructed local cadres that they will be held responsible for any social protest, and they've shown that they have very little patience and that the space for social protest is dramatically declining. So I think logically what we would say then is that, well, there will be less social protest then. But actually, there's a strange dynamic that's being created, and I see this a lot in the environmental sector, um, but local cadres are now being held responsible for not having protests. Local citizens know that they're being held responsible for not having local protests because local cadres now have to get all citizens to sign a document saying that they won't protest, that they agree with whatever the decision is, they agree with the policy, and they have to thumbprint these documents to show their support of it. Um, because the thumbprint, getting those thumbprints, is now part of the cadre evaluation process, and it's a hard goal, meaning that if they don't achieve this goal, they can't receive a promotion or a bonus or any sort of uh, reward. Um, so since citizens know this, what they're doing is they don't even have to protest. They just simply won't thumbprint the document. So local cadres, as they reach their deadline, because they're only given a certain amount of time in order to get everyone to agree to this, they start offering incentives. So they start negotiating with the villagers in order to give them whatever it is the villagers want. So the interesting thing that I'm seeing is that the more pressure that the central government is placing on local cadres to make sure that there isn't social protest is actually creating this, this easier channel for local villagers to get what they want out of the local government because they no longer have to organize and conduct protests, which are risky. Um, instead, now all they have to do is withhold their thumbprint um, until the deadline approaches. And then as that deadline approaches, local officials are more and more willing to negotiate with the villagers. Now that doesn't mean that there can't be use of violence, um, but that has been discouraged simply because it has a blowback effect where you see larger protests after the use of violence. If, I'd like to um, just uh, deepen a couple aspects of what Jessica was just saying because one of the things that I, I, I think is important to, um, to, to highlight is one of the things that she said, which was that protests can have any number of possible outcomes. And that's something that, you know, if you look at it just in terms of kind of the efficiency of outcomes, protests are very inefficient. Um, and it's something that when activists very often in China, uh, they see um, protest as a breakdown, as a failure of what they've tried to achieve uh, because the, that takes the, uh, the, the, the considerations of the, of the government that they're, that they're targeting, that the officials that they're, they're, they're actually engaging with. This changes the, um, the, uh, the very terms of the dialogue away from whatever the policy or whatever the issue is and moves it into something that the protesters really have no control over, and that is over social stability, um, which is something that trumps everything else. Um, so it's something that in the past, the protests that we see as successful are largely the ones that we see, which is to say the ones that make it into the news, the ones that make it into the, the local news in, in, in China, and eventually you know, some of them uh, trickle off into the, the New York Times, what have you. And we see that those kind of by nature of, of, of their exposure kind of lead to an outcome that is more, at least uh, in the short term, uh, 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 matches the goals or, or meets some of the goals of the protesters. But very often what you see is um, outcomes that do not favor uh, the activists. Um, and this is something, and I, I don't want to sound like an apologist for the uh, for the government, because this is a you know this is um, you know what Jessica's uh, talking about is something that's also easily corruptible. But what it does, in a very real sense, at least at this point in time, is that it does put power, real power, in a sense, um, 
in extortionary power, even if you want to put it that way, in the hands of Chinese citizens. Uh, how sustainable that is, I don't know, but it is something that is, it, it's quite a different dynamic, and it's quite a different power relationship than uh, has often, and even has, uh, has recently, um, been attributed to that level of state society relations. So that's something that's really interesting. A few quick questions about the political process we're discussing, and then uh, it might be valuable to move from these questions of process to questions about the substantive challenges that the process is, is, is meant to cope with. Uh, look, the uh, UN-US strike, the sneaker factory strike, uh, uh, which was involved a, a protest, right? A town was taken over. Uh, that wasn't too long ago. Are you guys saying that was a blast from the past? We're not going to see that sort of thing again? Um, I think labor protests are are a different issue than land and environmental protests. Um, I think that those protests, the administration seems to, and again, you know, this is reading the tea leaves, um, but the administration seems to um, not turn a blind eye, but be a little bit more open to labor protests. And so for groups that are protesting bad working conditions, especially with international factories or Taiwan and factories, um, I think that those protests seem to be um, tolerated a bit more. Um, so I don't think that protests will go away. I do think that there will be, especially in the area of labor, that there will be protests. I think there will also continue to be the, the community protests of, you know, we don't want a chemical plant in our town. Um, I think that you'll continue to see protests. I just think that a lot of these protests will be the last the last gap or the, or the last um, strategy that these groups want to use. So I think most groups will try to negotiate directly with the government. Um, they'll try other tactics before they, they use protest. But I still think we'll see protest in China. There's a lot of people, a lot of issues, a lot of complexity there. A quick question about the uh, uh, vehicle for responsiveness, uh, whether it succeeds or not, that people in this country are, are, are used to, that we haven't talked about uh, elections. Uh, and, you know, it was from Andy's work that I learned in detail about the, the possibilities of uh, responsiveness by a government to the people that have nothing to do with elections. Uh, but there are elections in China. There are uh, elections of village monitoring committees. Uh, there are uh, elections of delegates to uh, people's congresses. And in those elections, although they're all within the party, party members below the relevant uh, leadership uh, level can choose to nominate candidates in addition to the leadership slate. When they do, uh, they have a non-trivial chance of, of getting elected in, in, instead. Uh, now, you know, part of the communique from the... Uh, third plenum of the uh, 18th Central uh, 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 Committee meeting in uh, November 2013, the big statement that I think we're, we're all responding to, mm -hmm. part of that did emphasize uh, inter-party elections and inter-party democracy. How real is that? How important is it? Should we pay attention to it? I think that's a really good question. I think that um, we, I think that we are seeing that elections have had a real impact on local politics. Um, in that, we see through survey analysis that um, places that have local officials where they've been elected versus appointed, that they um, tend to collect less taxes. They also tend to provide more public services. There tends to be less social protest in those areas. So there is some sort of impact, at least on the level of governance, with having um, local officials elected. I think we've also seen that local people's congresses are more vibrant um, since they've been elected, um, and that local people's congress representatives are either voting against some of the policies or nominations that the party puts forward, or they're abstaining from the vote as a way to show their displeasure. So I do think that we're seeing more 
that, that we are seeing an effect from these elections, but the parties also set a pretty strong signal that they don't want to see the elections go above a certain level of government, that they'd like to keep elections more at lower levels, the village, the township, and not really go above that level. So as far as the overall impact that we might see on the system, as long as these elections are kept at such local levels, I think there will be an impact, but it might not be as extensive as we'd like to see. But as far as the the way or the, the um, intra-party democracy that might happen inside of the party, I think that that's an innovation that we should watch, um, especially to see how if these elections for party positions become more and more competitive, what that means inside the party as far as factionalism or the formation of different platforms. I think that that would be a really fascinating development to watch. Andy, what do you think? I think it's really important. You know, when we talk about township elections or village elections, I mean, really what we're doing is, if we're just focusing on that, we're 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 hearing the hand that the sound of one hand clapping. So uh, Jessica's absolutely right with all the things that she's been saying, and the initial motivation for having these local local level elections um, is largely to essentially create a better relationship between citizens and the party. Now that is not, it's very easy to kind of attach a cynical, you know, writer to that or a cynical interpretation of that. But ultimately, the, the party has always been, in addition to other things, a mass organization. And one of the key tenets of the party, going back to, you know, its very, very, you know, uh, beginnings in the, in the 20s and 30s, has been um, uh, the mass line and this, this, this relationship in a very, very, kind of very localized way. Um, with Chinese citizens. Now, the other hand of that is the fact that um, at the county level, which is just above the township, that is one of the administrative levels, it's the only administrative level in China that's actually uh, centralized from there on down. So China is a very, in, in uh, just, just to uh, simplify things, China is uh, bureaucratically quite a decentralized governing structure, at least as far as the government is concerned. Uh, the One of the few exceptions of that is from the administrative level of the county on down. So as long as the county magistrate is able to essentially control the area under his or her, usually his, jurisdiction, then uh, the party can allow for or um, uh, um, um, uh, tolerate kind of more of a, uh, a vibrant kind of inter-party democratic process and uh, uh, more open channels to kind of state and society, society relations. Um, that's one of the main reasons why uh, any time there's been some sort of an initiative to take elections up to the next administrative level, up to the county, that's something that stopped in its tracks, um, nipped in the bud as quickly as possible. Because that, that um, uh, signals, I think, a, a real change to the status quo. So as long as we keep in mind that Things stop, you know, the water's edge in this point, in, in this sense, um, really stops at the county level. What about party congresses at the county level, at the provincial level? Uh, uh, Melanie uh, Magnon has a, a study of uh, what happens when people choose, as they don't always, to uh, uh, contest the slate from uh, the, the leadership at that level by adding their own nominations. As I remember, uh, depending on the level, uh, 10, 25 percent of uh, the outside candidates uh, win. There's one case right at which a provincial party uh, secretary lost in a provincial uh, People's Congress election. It was embarrassing, more than embarrassing. He had to resign. Uh, is this a, a real form of accountability, or is it, for example, going to be one of the gray areas that shrinks as uh, uh, Xi Jinping 
asserts ownership over change in China? Well, I don't like to, as a rule, I don't like to predict the future in China because, you know, that's just a fool's errand. Um, but my sense is I don't necessarily, I, I don't necessarily see less of that happening, um, but I don't necessarily see that as uh, that not being a constriction of the gray area, mm -hmm. which is to say there are a lot of kind of the next step of uh, uh, the next several stages of economic development uh, are going to involve fundamental changes in terms of the incentive structure of uh, the way the center and the localities interact with one another. Um, the, the localities right now have a, a, a very strong interest in the status quo. Uh, and central level authorities have a very large interest in moving away from essentially what has been good to China up until now in terms of an economic development model um, and looking forward to the current and future stages of economic development, which will uh, involve a recasting of local incentives. Uh, and this is something that we're going to see, uh, I imagine, a fair amount of resistance to, because this is not a new thing. This is something that, that uh, the, the Hu Wen administration had also attempted to do um, and these largely fell flat. Um, so getting back to the earlier part of our conversation, if this in fact is um, uh, tied up with the kind of the more activist and more um, uh, hands-on uh, uh, and, and, and dynamic leadership style and, and sets of policy goals that Xi Jinping has, then I certainly would expect to see kind of more um, tensions and more of these types of outcomes vis-a-vis -vis local leaders in terms of getting recalcitrant uh, people out of the out of the way. Now what form that takes um, is anybody's guess, but my sense is we are we we certainly should not be surprised to see uh, it take the form of people being um, uh, removed or embarrassed in, in public forums like that. Uh, the difference being that that is not um, uh, something that is the result of a bottom-up process, but rather a top-down one. Political domination in China works through depoliticization. It's not politics. It's the market exchange. It works through rules, rule of the games. It works through person-to-person -person networks, interpersonal networks, and that is the secret of authoritarianism in China is this the depoliticization of everyday life. So let me talk about buying stability. Many of you might have heard that you know this is the primary means for the government to pacify protesters. It actually literally means that you use cash to pay people off and send them home. So in every local government that that we managed to visit and talk to everyone in Shenzhen and Beijing, street governments and the district government and the city level government, they all have what they call stability maintenance fund. And that ranges from several million, uh, several million yuan to a billion yuan in one of the Beijing um, districts in Beijing city. <coughs> and they use the money to, to pay cash, to dish out cash, to protesters and workers, landowners, uh, uh, peasants, and, and property owners. And, but they also use the cash uh, and the, money, the fund to pay for services that are at the, at the center of the dispute. So property owners trying to you know, fight the management companies, block the road um, uh, in resistance to, to, you know, to not, not to pay their management fees uh, because the management companies related to developers who in, encroach their rights on green space. Um, the government would come and stop the protest by giving to paying, you know, paying on their behalf the management fees. If the water pipe is the problem, they, do, they repair the water pipe using the fund and disband the protest. Um, workers, unpaid wages, they pay the wages first, send, go home, and then, and then they do their work later on. They compensate aggrieved citizens by providing all sorts of public goods and services. They build a school if property owners are unhappy about the neighborhood instead of having them on the street protesting. 
they promised them new green space, gardening, new security gate, a new school to send the kids to. So the fund is used to dish out cash, but as well as providing public goods that were at the center of the contention. Um, it, has, it looks like ad hoc, it looks like it's arbitrary, but it's not. It has become so routinized, patterned, that people have this jingle that again, for people from China, you would have heard, big disturbance, big resolution, small disturbance, small resolution, no disturbance, no resolution, which means that you have to create some kind of disturbance if you want the government to really take seriously your complaint and do something to resolve your problem. The money that they use to maintain social stability, the budget for that has ballooned so much that in 2010, starting 2010, the Financial Times has for the first time reported that the money, the budget, the central government budget for domestic public security exceeds the money for external defense. And since that year, for the past few years, it has stayed that way. So the, ra the ratio, the money that they spend on internal security actually is enormous. But if you think that paying cash every time you have a protest is what is happening in China, then, then you're wrong. Because if you start paying people money, every time they show up in 10 or 20 or 50 kind of person group, then you set up the trouble. They come back tomorrow, and you have to pay them again. So the essence in buying stability is not so much the payment. You have to pay, but you need to know how to pay them in such a way that they won't come back to ask for more. So that's why we need to look at the process of buying stability. How actually is stability being purchased by cash? So we need to look at protest bargaining. Through the research, what we find is that this bargaining is the key to China's stability, but also is the crisis of authoritarianism that I would explain later. But let's focus on the process of bargaining. The process of bargaining basically transformed a confrontational situation into one that is a non-zero-sum bargaining process. You get something, it's non-zero-sum. You're not talking about to the state who is against you, that you too would have some shared interest at the end of this process. Through this non-zero-sum bargaining process, state and citizens, they are bind together in a pragmatic but quite precarious kind of alliance. And I'll explain this, but this is the kind of statement that I want to put into your head and for you to follow as I explain the process. So what happens when, let's say I'm using a real example that we encounter in the field, 500 workers did not get paid and they decided to block a road in Shenzhen and 500 of them, and why this road? The workers are very clever because they know that that day, well no, not the day, tomorrow, that road will be passed, there will be, a, there will be lots of vehicles passing by because a leader from Beijing is going to his hotel through that road. And the night before that, they stage a protest, not choosing other roads, but that particular road, to call the attention of the officials. So, let's, so what happened? Something like this. What will be triggered? Immediately, within five or 10 minutes, this road blockage incident will be reported to a center in the local government. There is, in every local government you go to, you will see this big sign saying that this is a center of integrated um, security, petition, and stability bureau. And is, is, is present in any street government um, and township government, and is staffed by people who will be there 24 hours on call. And as soon as they get this information, there will be a triage system. The of official there will immediately classify, categorize this unrest according to the number of people involved, the kind of money that will be estimated to be involved in this incident, the contagious potential of this incident. So they have a very well mapped out kind of chart, categorization of this particular incident. And with that, immediately it will be a triage that there will be a flow chart to show to that person on, in, on call, to, to tell him which number to call, who are the officials who should be arrived on scene within five minutes, who should be text 
to be reported about this incident, and who should be reported or receive a re you know this report, who get this report tomorrow. So the, the hierarchy officials who should be dealing with this case and who should show up on site, who should be aware of it, um, are well categorized. And so the person will just you know communicate this, and and within five, ten minutes, somebody from the government will be will show up on site, and what they will do on site once they show up is that they would start emotion control. These people, these grassroots officials, would put up a very human face. They would, as what they told us, they have to make friends and talk love with these protesters, basically assuring them that they are on their side, calm down, give them their cell phone number, so that in the, even in the middle of the night, even after they were disbanded home, they can call up this official. So to, to really you know, tell, tell the protesters that you are on the side, the government is listening, you give them your cell phone. And you really try to show your support for these people. Um, so emotion control is the first step. And let me quote you about this official who have been so experienced in Beijing dealing with, he has seven years of experience handling all sorts of demolition and relocation cases, and he told us that he has many times residents, workers, who threaten to jump off buildings or drink poison in front of him. And he, has, he dealt with these with calm because, I quote, all you need to do to deal with these incidents is to let people see the hope of making some profit and solving their real livelihood problems. I personally think that Chinese people are really easy to govern because all they want from you is economic interest. But dealing with different kinds of people, we'll have to use different languages and methods. For instance, teachers, people like us. They are shy to talk about money, so they talk about the law and regulations, beat around the bush all the time. But their real goal is money. Peasants, farmers, are straightforward. They make direct demands for money. So, he knows people's goal is not really to die. They don't want to kill themselves. They want to threaten you so that you would take care of their problems. Um, so they control emotion. These guys are extremely sensitive and it gives a human face to an authoritarian state, to these citizens who are angry, who are capable of mobilizing a collective protest. So once they get to the point of controlling emotion, they would ask these protesters to select their uh, representatives, direct election from an authoritarian state. Um, they want to find representatives. Why? Because once they elect representatives, they can put order in chaos. They don't want to deal with chaos, they don't want to deal with passion. Passion is difficult to control. They want to deal with rational discussion of interest. For people who have read Albert Hirschman, passion and interest. To channel passions into rational discussion of interest, you need representatives. And once you have representatives, what they want, these rep what they want to do with representatives is to fragment the group from within. Because once they set, know that five people represent the group, they will send the group home and talk to these five people. And what do they talk to them about? Let me quote you. I first asked them to elect, select 10 representatives, and I talked to these representatives individually about their own domestic and personal situations. I know I can ferment them and exploit the conflict of interest. As soon as they see some opportunity for making a gain, they will eventually agree. The, they call these people handles, access points. And once you find these handles and access points, you have the ability to take care of their, to bribe them, basically. And you fragment labor, you fragment peasant, you, you do class fragmentation through these leaders and therefore demobilize collective disobedience. You sit down with these leaders. You, in addition to bribing them, you need to transform their rights consciousness. Now, the Chinese studies literature talks a lot about rights consciousness, rising rights consciousness. And the idea in the literature was that citizens know their, their rights because of all the laws that have been promulgated. And once they read the law books, they know their rights and they go to the street to demand those rights. No. The process that we find is more complicated than that. People may start it out with 
what they imagine their rights are. I, I'm a laborer. I'm a peasant. I have rights to my land. I have rights to my wage. People may start out with these rights in their head, but once they go through this process of protest bargaining, these officials manage, in many, many cases, to reshape their rights consciousness. No, that's the rights in the law book. To transform that into realistic, pragmatic, realizable rights under the circumstances of China. So for example, laborers blocking the road because they didn't get salary, wages. The official arrived on scene and talked to the um, representatives. So they insisted, we have the rights, we are laborers, the labor law says we, need, we, can be, we should be paid. Yes, the labor law says you should be paid. Do you have labor contract? No, 50% of workers in China don't have labor contracts. So you can't go to the court because you don't have labor contracts. In that process, this official would transform the understanding of labor rights into realistic labor rights rather than the theoretical labor rights in the law book and settled for a discounted wage payment by the employers. The officials would also talk to the employer saying that, do you want, how much would you lose if these workers don't work for one day? Why don't you pay them 80% or 50% of what they sh you should pay them? And they bring these two groups together and in the process transform people's idea of rights. We have another case in an environmental protest. These, this, um, Elderly naval intelligence officer, retired naval intelligence um, officer, uh, in Ch uh, the Chinese officer who had been party member for 20 years. He was the leader of a massive protest on about against noise, representing you know the neighborhood property owners against the building of a road that creates noise. And at the end of the process, he 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 struggled against these officials talk to them, have meetings with them, and at the end of the process, he said, the government has increased its budget for reducing the noise and we don't want to protest anymore. Because in a process of, of negotiation, his consciousness of rights changed once he realized who decided to build this road, how much or how little wiggle room he has in changing the, the decision upstairs. And he began to understand that there's no way for them to look at the environmental law and get what the residents want. So as soon as he sees the, the government is giving concession, they're trying to do something, um, you know, spending more money on optimizing noise reduction rather than actually canceling the building of the road, he said, we have reached our goals. In the process of process bargaining, a very important element is the show of force and a threat to use force. What we realized is that in many protest situations, the central government has imposed the, or the, in, the injunction that we have to use force judiciously. That force cannot be used in all cases because that would be counterproductive, that would radicalize, escalate um, the, the conflicts between the government and the citizens. So police, actually, from many of the things that we have observed, they were just there. They didn't dare to arrest people unless, unless they were attacked. So the threat of force, and uh, what we found very interesting is that officials, the grassroots officials, would use force, threaten to use force in a skillful way, in the sense that they both arrest some leaders when they become really recalcitrant and uncompromising, but they also engineer their release, and they do it deliberately. That is, they are the ones who arrest protesters, especially the leaders, but they are also the ones who release them. Why? Because through this arrest and release process, they gain the trust of these leaders. They know they will protect the government, it will protect them, but they have to cooperate with the government. And so it's a way of co-opting citizens' cooperation through the use of threat. Finally, very interesting, one of the most <laughs> unexpected discoveries in this process of protest bargaining is that we realize sometimes, very strangely, these grassroots officials instruct protesters how to protest. They would teach workers how to, how to strike. You don't strike on the street, you don't go beyond the factory gate, but you block the most effective way to strike to get your result, to really get the salary that you want, is to block the warehouse. 
so that your employer cannot send the goods out to fulfill the orders that would block your employers getting the money. And you really you know, threaten your employer that way instead of going onto the street and trigger the police. Why do they do that? What we realize is there is mutual interest between the protesters and these grassroots officials because grassroots officials want, they want a certain level of instability. They want a certain level of unrest in their jurisdiction. They don't want total stability and quiet because a certain level of insta instability can justify them to ask upstairs for a bigger budget and also it can demonstrate to upstairs the use of these stability maintenance officials. So we trace the promotion record of these officials from the street level to the district to the municipal level and what we realize is in the past few years the people who get most promotions they're mostly from the stability maintenance system. And if there is no unrest in your jurisdiction. You can't ask for budget, you can't increase your manpower, you can't show your importance, and you have very little prospect of getting promoted. And so protest is a means for citizens to bargain, to get real payoff, material payoff, cash, jobs, schools, whatnot, from the government. But for the grassroots official, they need that too. So they both, state and society, at the grassroots level, capitalize on instability, but it's not all positive. We talk to officials and they hate this process. I quote you this official, the people don't trust the government and they don't respect the authority or the law. The government's authority has been eroded for a long time. That's why the masses use every opportunity to eke out more benefits for themselves. The officials themselves feel the laws of authority in an authoritarian state. What about the citizens? Citizens, those protesters who obtain benefits through the process, they're not happy either. They get the benefits, but they describe the situation to us as signing unequal treaties, like China being under duress, signed the treaties with the government. They say, this is from a protest leader, we ordinary citizens can never successfully fight the government. They set the price. They set the price. And you either take it or leave it. The power holders can use all kinds of methods to make us comply. So even coming out of this kind of bargaining process, the side, both sides gain materially. Officials feel they don't have any authority. Citizens feel injustice. They feel violated. So both sides come out of this protest bargaining, feeling diminished, resentful, and reticent. So it's pervasive, it preserves stability, and is a very effective way. Um, but the long-term consequence is that I think there's a creeping process of erosion of the party state's authority in what look, still looks like a very authoritarian state. So that is, there's no more authority in authoritarianism. And citizens are willing in this process to bargain away the right, to sell the right. It's a commodification of both state authority and citizens' right. So where is China headed with all these um, information that I've given you? Is it sustainable? Is this kind of buying stability sustainable? It is sustainable, but it depends on several conditions. One, it is sustainable as long as China, the state's infrastructure and physical capacity remains the same. That is, as long as it can reach deep down to every neighborhood and village with the same kind of financial capacity to dish out money. That is, that the amount exceeds that the amount for you know, external defense. Now, we can't guarantee the Chinese state will always be that deep pocketed that it will have this kind of physical prowess. So anytime you have a physical crisis in China, that would very easily translate into a political crisis. That is why the Chinese government is so intent on keeping the economy growing. It can't let the economy sink because it has a lot to do with stability. 
Also, it depends on citizens willing to bargain away their right. If citizens insist on not marketized, not commodified their right, there is no way this kind of protest bargaining can sustain. And what you see in Hong Kong as we speak, Chinese students in Hong Kong, they are boycotting classes. There is a territory-wide boycott going on because China has given rules to limit direct election of the chief executive. And Chinese citizens, Hong Kong citizens are saying to, the China, uh, to Beijing, we want economic growth, but we're not going to bargain away our democratic aspiration. We want universal suffrage. But I'm not seeing in mainland China that Chinese citizen is putting up the same message to the Chinese authority. So another condition for this protest bargaining to, to continue, to buy the stability to continue, is whether citizens compl are complicit in this game of selling citizens' rights. Uh, the processes that you call commodification, often they seem like things that happen in the United States, except rather better. Uh, for example, uh, there's, there's agreements and there's a process which ends with compensation. Mm -hmm. We call them lawsuits <laughs> in the United States, uh, but they're risky. You have to pay lawyers lots of money, and usually you don't get what you want. Mm -hmm. Uh, and sometimes when workers are disappointed, they do things in the United States to get concessions. We call them strikes. Usually they fail in the United States. Uh, material interests affecting uh, people's politics, like the grandmas and the granddads, well, we call it voting your material interests that you can vote for. And, uh, it's, it's routine. What's in it for me, people ask. Uh, well, in the U.S., uh, the powdered uh, uh, milk isn't uh, uh, poisonous, <laughs> and the, there aren't uh, pigs floating in the rivers. Someone might say, then, why the discrepancy isn't what's going on in China a result of courts not being very powerful, regulatory agencies mm -hmm. yep. uh, not being yes. well equipped, and uh, officials being susceptible to bribes leading to corruption that's actually the level you would expect for Chinese per capita GDP. So why are you scaring us, I would say, about uh, how authoritarian it maintains itself in China by telling us it leads to social decay? Well, because the big difference between compensation that people get in the U.S. Yes, you can modify your rights because you get your rights violated, you get compensated in monetary terms. The difference, the big difference there is that in China, as opposed to the U.S., it depends on who you are. It depends on whether you have the capacity to mobilize, to pull off something like this, collective action, if you want to get compensation from the government through this kind of protest bargaining. In the United States, you have whoever you are. The law protects you the right to sue, to get compensation through the court. In China, it is not guaranteed rights that you can pursue justice through a system. You get compensation only if you overcome this collective action problem only if um, you d you're not scared, only if there are many conditions for you to get rights. And, and, and so I think it's, it's not quite the same, even though in this country you get compensated for rights being violated. Um, in China there is no, um, it, it, it has to take a lot of courage and mobilization effort to get to the point where bargaining would happen, and even that, you have to know how to play that game. And um, it's extremely scary uh, to, to confront the state for many people. Um, you don't have the security uh, of pursuing that kind of collective action. There's no liberty of doing it. So I think it's quite different. And the point about social decay is when people have lost the ability to differentiate what is corruption and what is not corruption, what is your right what is not your right, 
what is the limit to the market? What can market not do? Where market should not apply? That is when you see people willing to buy the way, to buy whatever they want, to sell whatever they want. And that's why you see people they have no moral responsibility to people who would be poisoned by the rice that they grow knowingly, <laughs> knowing that it would lead some people to die. And there are a lot of issues that are just, you know, unimaginable in other society because people really objectively in the society and subjectively do not uh, have any moral boundary to what market should not go, where market should not go, and where the rule of exchange, price cannot apply.